I might need help to get that PDF screen. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, I feel very much at home in the questions that you bring up. <coughs> um, and I will speak about that research that you mentioned. Um, and I was pretty much in the same situation in 2000, 2001, when I thought if I should better quit um, and do something else. I studied visual arts, um, and I was a young artist. And the moment I thought this, actually, I thought, well, I'm certainly not the first one to feel like this, and uh, to look for an answer to the situation I'm in, how I can relate to social reality as an artist. Um, and that idea became an exhibition that I made in the Leipzig Academy um, and it was entitled Quitting Art, Gestures of Disappearance. And it was my first approach to um, go further in investigating different case studies, different examples of how artists were deeply questioning the possibility of practicing, doubting their position in the art world, maybe daunting the efficiency of the art world as a whole. And while I started researching this exhibition, I found that nothing had ever been, been written on the topic. So there were no histories being written down on artists who left the art world. Um, and there was no theoretic foundation. And that became a long, year-long project that I started then. And this exhibition um, had Arthur Craven, Lee Lozano, it was Lee Lozano's first exhibition in Europe, actually after she had quit. Um, Bastian Ader and Chris Burden. Very different characters, very different works. And if you look at, at this on the top, you have Chris Burden, the disappearance performance from 71. And this is obviously an artwork, an art action, it's a performance. And Chris Burden is really no one who dropped out of art. He became a very successful artist. But, of course, he questioned his role and his place within the art world um, in a time where artistic role models shifted very much after 68. You might know that after 68, in the very early 70s, this is maybe the moment of deepest doubt in many, many artists. Um, because the entire role model seems to change um, after many utopias seem to not be able to become reality, the cultural pro producer had to reconfigure their position in the field. And the other work is by Lee Lozano, the general strike piece. And if you look at it, it does not feel really like an art piece, even though it is called an art piece. It is not really a performance. Um, because she's talking about something very totalitarian in a way, the total personal and public revolution. And uh, she's talking about withdrawing from the functions of the art world. So between these two works, there seems to be a difference. And um, I needed to become clearer about the classification of such different works and also what they were aiming for and where we could actually localize them. And um, therefore, I, I wrote a theoretic foundation of the artistic dropout to describe it in a more systematic way. And the most simple definition I could find was this one. And you see, this is a very uh, basic sociologic description. There's someone who is an actor in the art field, and we can observe him or her as such, and at a later point we can't. 
very easy, but I think it's very, really fundamental. And it implies that A, someone has been an actor in the art world, so you need to have a place somewhere in order to do about. If you don't even get that place, if you're not accepted as an artist, if you're not somehow success successful, at least in the sense that you could proceed working, it makes no sense speaking about dropping out. You just don't get in, basically. Um, and then also, I chose to talk about an actor in the art world because it's not only about artists. Sometimes people say, ah, you're an art dropout. No, I'm not. I changed my role from the art, from an artist to a curator, to a writer, to a gallerist, which is what many people do. We just change our roles and our practices uh, within the art world, but we are all actors in the art world. So not only artists are leaving eventually the art world, but also curators do, critics do, gallerists do, professors do. And to become more precise, you know, since the 90s, there had been an ever-growing discussion on the notion of the performativity. And in that context, it became also clear that inaction is indeed an action. So if you're not doing something, this not doing is doing something. And sometimes it's doing more than doing something. Yeah? And with regard to withdrawal, and dropouts and artistic inactivity, uh, I suggest to distinguish between what I call as an ostentatious inaction, which means an inaction that is meant to be seen by others. And you are familiar with works like John Cage, you know, 433, where nothing is happening, but it's happening on stage. Nothing is staged. Yeah. This is ostentatious. Uh, or Robert Barry, uh, who announced an exhibition, and the announcement was during da -da -da, the gallery will be closed. So these are clearly symbolic gestures. Yeah. Um, and the second term is especially necessary to understand someone like Duchamp. Because Duchamp, as you might know, was not practicing art for a long time. Um, and as Joseph Beuys said, Duchamp's silence is overestimated. Um, but Duchamp's silence was really a challenge in the art world for many people, because he was important, but he was not doing anything. Which is not true. He was doing a whole lot of things. He was a very important actor in the art world all the time. He was dealing with art. Um, he, was, uh, he was debating, he was writing letters to many people, uh, he was traveling, he was extremely visible with his silence. So I call this communicative inaction, because this is totally possible. And it actually happens um, from time to time. But what we are talking about today, or what you mentioned, is what I call the radical inaction. And it means that you really stop any practice and any participation in the art world. Uh, and it's fascinating to see the film that you have done, because this artist is exactly speaking about things that are important to this. Namely, to say goodbye to friends, to artist friends, to not go to any openings anymore. This really means, on a daily basic, dropping out. And there are some significant artists who did so. Eugen Schönebeck, maybe you don't know, uh, he was a, a, a friend and studio partner of Georg Baslitz, the famous German painter. And Eugen Schönebeck, as many people say, was quite better than Baslitz at the time. But he was the more political guy. And uh, when their paintings started becoming successful, he dropped out. Because he was really interesting in, in taking a political position with the politics and not having success on the art market. Um, and we'll talk about Charlotte Posnensky and Lee Lozano a bit further. Uh, Laurie Parsons and Katie Noland, incredibly important artists at the end of the 80s and the early 90s, and they both 
dropped out, Lori Parsons actually uh, does social work in the United States and never even mentions that she was an artist because she finds that terrifying, actually, to speak about this. So if you look here, um, there's a moment around the 1970, and as I mentioned, this seems to be a quite interesting moment in time um, because of the political transitions that happen, and those have consequences for many artists. Um, but this is the question that I want to go deeper into, and I have to quote myself a bit and read you some paragraphs from my text. So, besides these first case studies that I had found, who else, how many others before or after them have reached the same conclusion? How many different reasons are there for giving up art for a time or forever? And how old are these reasons? How far back does discontent and doubt about art go, and the ambition to go beyond art in the sense of going elsewhere? As far as the 1940s and 1930s, how many artists who sought to distance themselves from fascism or St Stalinism gave, gave up when they realized their art was powerless against these regimes? And what about the Dadaists? in the late 1910s, who did not want to be, quote, sidetracked into aesthetics, end quote, and who felt it necessary, quote, to come out against art because the Dadaist has seen through its fraud as a moral safety value, end quote. This is Richard Hülsenbeck in 1920. At the outbreak of World War I in 1914, Hugo Ball stated that, quote, art Make, no longer makes any sense, end quote. And he was not alone in thinking that way. Arthur Craven, a forerunner of Dada, described by Duchamp as a central figure of the Parisian avant-garde in the early 1910s, fled from this avant-garde as much as he did from military service. And in 1970, 1917, in the wake of the October Revolution, Russian artists and intellectuals called for all artistic creativity to serve the proletarian community, advocating, like the Dadaists, quote, complete integration of art into life, end quote. Does that mean the end of art, sometimes? When the neo-impressionists, an anarchist group of artists, actually, around Georges Seurat and Paul Signac, disbanded in 1890 following a dispute over the definition of a socially oriented concept of art, the Belgians Willy Finch and Henry van der Velde decided to lay down their brushes. Earlier, the French painter Gustave Courbet had become a member of the Council of the Paris Commune and played a key role in establishing a socialist administration in Paris from 1869 to 1871. His outspoken attacks on the symbols of a much-hated order were carried out not on the canvas, but on the political and institutional stage although he gained little acclamation for these activities in his posthumous retrospective. Actually, there's an interesting text that describes that art historians had never, ever written about Kobe being a political activist. They just somehow erased these two years of his life. In 1871, having been accused of complicity in the dismantling of the Vendôme column, he was sent to prison, where he, for, fortunately for art historians, resumed painting. But even before this, in the years surrounding the 1848 revolution, artists in Paris held heated debates on the relationship between the symbolic power of artistic practice, on the one hand, and revolutionary politics, on the other the choice between, quote, the paintbrush and the dagger, end quote. Who knows how many of these artists decided to renounce art for the sake of the revolution? We don't know. No one has ever counted them. 
it is actually impossible to track them. No one can say how many artists have abandoned their craft and why. All we have is assumption and speculation and very few examples that we can actually study. It seems likely, though, that in times of political and cultural upheaval, when art's social function changes, not all players remain in the game. In the years around 1870, 1917, 1968, and after 1989, artists, along with many others of their time, came out in protest and demanded change. They sought to establish a new social and political order and were forced to ask themselves whether their art had the power to achieve these goals or not. How many chose to trade in their artistic production for another practice that felt more promising, more effective, more relevant with regard to the social challenges of the moment? How many chose to not risk a marginalized position and to not assume the unhappy role of the artiste maudit, classical term, the cursed artist, or the artiste raté, the failed artist, but instead became artiste dissocié or détaché, or quite simply, ex-artists. People who have voluntarily withdrawn from producing work, who removed themselves from the art scene and relinquished the role of the artist in order to do something else. There must actually be many such people. And there are most probably more ex-artists in the world than artists. So this is a huge phenomenon, once you start thinking about it, a phenomenon on which we know almost nothing. Except, that's what I said, a few case studies, and Lilo Zanu, from everything that I could find during my research, is the only case where you can really track a dropout step by step, because it evolved in her artistic practice, and uh, we also have notebooks. So I will try to quickly walk you through Lee Lozano. That's her, in her mid and 30s, where she was a painter in New York, not without success. She had shows, a gallery, she sold, uh, she knew uh, many artist colleagues in the avant-garde, was a close friend of Carl Andre. Dan Graham was, was her friend and, and lover and partner for a while. So she was not isolated at all. <coughs> And then in 68, 69, she stopped doing paintings and did the so-called language pieces um, that had been forgotten for almost 30 years, but that made her today one of the most important and earliest female conceptualists. There are 50 of these language pieces. Some of them are really funny. Actually, most of them are quite funny. Um, and when you look at them closely, they deal with all the different elements that are important for an existence of an artist, from, but also a human being. Uh, from her dealing with, uh, with food, with drugs, with sex, with money, the relationship um, with the galleries, how to make an exhibition. So everything that somehow is important in her life becomes pulled in uh, the language pieces, and what she does is, as you see, she's giving herself instructions what to do. And the general strike piece, um, that is maybe the most important one, you can see that, actually, well, it's dialogue, um, she's giving herself the instruction to withdraw from the art world. And in the next step, she does dialogue piece, because she sits in her studio, to basically, is quite alone, and she makes the dialogue piece. And what she does, she's calling people from the art world and invites her to have a dialogue. And if you look on this notation, it says, um, I don't know where, the purpose of this piece is to have a dialogue and not make a piece. So she's somehow opening um, a space in between, yes, this is a piece, this is clearly formalized, this is true for all the language pieces. So you see, this is not just an idea, it's, uh, it's very carefully written down with footnotes that have specific symbols, so this is clearly a given form. 
But then the dialogues start to become, become something where at one point she writes in her notebooks, uh, I might do this for the rest of my life. So it somehow overwhelms the possibility to give it a form, almost. Huh? Uh, invite a cat and a baby for a dialogue. You see, she somehow is trying to push it to an unlimited possibility of interaction with others. And she tracks all the different conversations. There's pages and pages and pages who, what people she called on the phone in order to invite them, what they had spoken about when they came, etc. So, and this is not a piece, this is a quite important statement she made at the Art Workers Coalition. You might know the Art Workers Coalition, an influential, um, very politicized movement in New York, uh, where artists, for example, uh, claimed the right to uh, decide on what artists might exhibit at the MoMA, uh, get paid for exhibiting, etc. And she was at a public hearing, and this is her conclusion. She, she mocks about these people, as she does later on, on the feminists that she also meets in New York. Um, and she says, I will not call myself an art worker, but rather an art dreamer. And again, she says, I will only participate in a total revolution, simultaneously personal and public. So she insists on something very, very um, utopistic, I think we should say. And here, this is from 1970. You see, there's a lot of anger actually, against other artists, against the New York art world. Uh, and she's very disappointed that the project of revolution that she has in mind and has shared and discussed with others intellectually uh, is not something that is not going to happen, and that the artists are actually not really interested in, in changing society. This is what she feels. May 68. So this speaks a clear language. And these are no artworks, huh? these are her private notebooks. And you can feel when you go through these notebooks and the language pieces that there's a decision that is preparing for her. And at some point, it becomes clear April 1970, there suddenly she speaks about the dropout piece. And this is now a very crucial moment also for the theory of the whole thing. Uh, many authors in the last years and curators have referred to the dropout piece as Lee Lozano's last piece that she has practiced until her death in 1999 which is, to me, absolutely nonsense. Uh, a, the dropout piece is not a piece. It is not written down anywhere. There's just this remark in her private notebooks. And I would find it totally absurd to uh, call a life decision like this an artwork. And also, it's not true, because all the commentators did not read the other pages of the notebook. And there it becomes totally clear what the motivation is. It involves the destruction of powerful emotional habits. I want to get over my habit of emotional dependence on love. I want to start trusting myself and others more. She's not speaking about the art world anymore. And indeed, she has, uh, she's quite addicted to, to, to dope, to sex. Uh, she has a quite not-so-easy life, and she wants to change this. 
This is more about a woman who went to, to, to get out of a restricted life that doesn't make her happy anymore. So here, in the end, you see, there again is the, the societal dimension that is really important for her. And uh, she closes down her studio in 72 and uh, is gone. Like for 25 years, actually, nobody knew where she was. And then only shortly before her death, um, um, two galleries from New York contacted her again, and that was the only contact that existed. So that's Lee Lozano. And this is Charlotte Posenenska. Same time, around 68, 69, German minimalist who was quite influential at the time uh, with these minimalist sculptures industrial material, industrial form, but different from American minimalism, those sculptures are meant to be used by people. So you can flip these doors, it's a cube that changes with the people while they walk in and play with the different forms. That's why I call works like her participatory minimalism. And she's invited by Art Forum in 1968 to make a statement on one page about her work, which she does. Um, and she explains how these works uh, actually function, that they are meant to be used by the people and to be transformed, etc. And then in the end, suddenly, she says something very surprising. And this is the English translation. It is painful for me to face that art cannot contribute to the solution of urgent social problems. Written in February 68, published in May 68. Same moment like Lee Lozano. And then again, she stops her practice, no studio. She doesn't respond to uh, any proposals for exhibitions anymore. And she studies sociology, and in 79, she publishes this book together with her partner, Burkhard Brunn, that is some hardcore sociologic theory analysis uh, on Fordistic production methodologies and how they accounted. It's, it's really tough when you read it through. But her conviction was that doing this sort of work was much more important uh, for the equality in society than what her art could actually do with the offer of participation. And what became important for me while I was comparing these two women was that I think it helps us to see two very different qualities in the dropout. And I call the one the regressive dropout, which is Lee Lozano. Why regressive? Because it gets her out of art but it gets her no place else. Whereas Charlotte Posenenska stops her practice because she has understood that there's another practice, another field in which she can work that is more promising than what her art was. And she does something that we rarely have in mind because we're culturally, historically conditioned in a different manner, that art can be a ladder that you can use to go someplace else and throw away when you don't need it anymore. Yeah? Just the occidental notion of art and artists doesn't allow this, yeah? to think in such a pragmatic way. I don't know how much time I have left. I still have some time. This is a funny graphic I made this morning. In order to say, because this is, um, 
I think this is what it really is. You have actors with a practice who are in a certain social field, who have a certain visibility, who have a speech in there, and then they start to leave that field and practice someplace else and have their voice somewhere else. And as I said, it's really hard for us to track that and to observe this. But as you can see, especially with the Lilozano, there's a moment of transition. There's something like a performative zone where the dropout is actually being practiced. It's not happening from one second to another. It's a whole cascade of decision that you take, one after the other. One relation you cut after the other. One thing you let go to take up another and start something new. So there's a whole lot of transitions and shift that you can actually observe in a practice if you look at it well. Yeah? And those are the little light zones where I think if, you if we look at it closely, we can describe it. And this can tell us a lot about the conditions of the art world, because you see clearly with Lilo Zano and Charlotte Posenenska, they have a consciousness about the political, economic, institutional, social conditions of, uh, that actually inform, enable or limit their practice. And they try to negotiate that zone. They try to push their potential action in the art world and then understanding, no, I can't go further here, so I have to make a choice. So you understand a lot about what were the historic conditions in 68, in 1914, uh, in 1848, etc. cetera, um, if you look at it that way. And on the other hand, it helps you to understand that quitting art can be an act of emancipation. Yeah? It can be something very encouraging because you free yourself from something that feels restrictive uh, and make a better choice. And to end with, I will just read something because I think this is really crucial to understand why this is so uncommon for us, or has been uncommon until recent years. So why had we never heard of ex-artists? Because artists are not meant to just stop being artists. They either fail or die. As it turns out, oh, this reminds me that I have five minutes left. As it turns out, this problem goes back as far as the early Renaissance and the birth of the Giotto legend. Vasari tells the story of how the young shepherd boy Giotto was discovered by a mature artist who saw him drawing on a rock and who immediately recognized his extraordinary talent. Giotto thus became the prototype of the artistic genius whose talent was not acquired through hard work or training, but was a gift of nature and a gift of God. This myth elevated him and the arch archetypal artists. Sorry. This myth elevated him and the artists of every subsequent era above the mere craftsmen. Even now, we bear the legacy of this successful attempt to accord the artist a special status in the hierarchy of skilled craft occupations. Who, having been granted the status of the artist with, within such a hierarchical system, would ever think of relinquishing it. From the exalted position of the artistic genius who has gained the recognition of the church, the king and his professional colleagues, the only direction one can do is down, back to the profound level of mundane craftsmanship. And if an artist is deemed to possess the even greater gift of divine inspiration given by God, it would in fact be sacrilegious to refuse it. And this myth of the artist genius came to us over romanticism, yeah? 
uh, and was um, um, and was rewritten during uh, modernity, but it's deeply within our notion of art and the artist. And this is why I think for a long, long, long time it was almost impossible to even bring up the question whether an artist could stop being an artist. Because it's not something that you can start and stop, like any business. But my proposal is this is actually this is exactly how we should see it. It's just one of the things we can do and also stop doing. Yeah? It's one of these passions, it's one of these practices, it's one of these possibilities, but it's also something that sometimes makes us impossible to act and to reach what we want to do. Um, and I suggest a totally anti-essentialist dealing with the artist role model. And I think this is the point I want to make. Thank you. A few minutes for questions, right? Um, thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. And uh, if anyone wants to ask, I will come over to you with the microphone. I was thinking, are you also interested in artists who also practice something else? For example, I study law and I both go to art school and I've also been thinking about stopping the whole art thing. <laughs> but yeah, I see it as kind of a balance for me. Mm -hmm. And now I try to also like use um, how I practice art for, uh, for law to just get an other point of view, but yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. I, I, th I think this is also something that we usually never do. It's like whether you're an artist or not. And if you're an artist and do something else also, this something else is usually seen as minor. Oh, you have to work f to make a living, too bad. Yeah? Um, but just think about yeah, saying, I'm an artist and a lawyer. People would look at you like, uh-huh. Well, that sounds weird. Yeah? That's why I went back to Giotto, because why is that so? Yeah? I think 95% would look at you hmm, like this. Why aren't there 95% saying, wow, that's amazing. So you have two, two different experiences. How do they relate to each other? How do you maybe swap one thing from the one field to the other? You have an amazing opportunity there that not that someone who only does painting uh, has not. Well, they have other possibilities, but you have this one, very specific. Great, tell me more. This is not the way we usually deal with it. But I think we should. If that's an answer. Scientists or you know, people who studied math or uh, physics and also do art, which is but I'm more interested in the social part, and I don't. That's also why I study law instead of something like science. Um, and I don't know that much like other examples of this. But I thought maybe you can like because I never really looked into it in a way. But now you're talking about this phenomenon, which I've also been thinking about. But like I didn't know like that someone actually studied this. So I thought maybe you could give me examples of people with these both practices or something. So I think it's 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 twisted in very funny ways. Very often p people from for themselves or also make a make a harsh distinction. Yeah? Like I'm a poet, yeah? but I'm a lawyer. So when I'm a lawyer, I'm not telling the people I'm writing poems at night, and with my poet colleagues, I'm not going to say that I'm in the office in the morning. You know, things like that. And I think that happens quite often. And where it becomes most twisted is in the relationship between art and politics. Yeah? Um, for example, if you have a political engagement, are you having this engagement as an artist or just as a citizen, and does it make sense to claim that this is an artistic engagement? Why would you do this? And if so, why exactly? 
Yeah, let's look at this. What's the artistic element in there? Which would mean how do you deal with visibility, aesthetics? What, like, is that what it means when you say do this as an artist? Yeah? Um, because this is what this question comes down to for you also. So what is that relationship and where is the political aspect? And of course, I would always say a lot of art is deeply political in an imminent way. Yeah? There are zillions of artworks uh, that when you draw the consequences from them, you touch on very deep political notions. Yeah? So you don't need a red flag and walk in the street in order to touch on the political. You know, that would be a total misunderstanding of the symbolic capacities of art, I think. Yeah? But it is very true that, especially in the last like 10 years, where I have the feeling the you had a moment where the art world was very politicized in the 90s. And I think that the discourse about it was quite sharp. And then it got more and more populistic in the last years, I have the feeling. And there were many people walking around and claiming the notion of the political uh, within the art world. Uh, and I think we must try to be sharp in our distinctions, and especially in our interests, and say, why is the art world a good place? if I have a, um, a political project, yeah? and if I have a political project, do I want to be efficient with my practice in a political way, which maybe means in a really pragmatic, administrative way, or is the efficiency the creation of symbols or changing people's mind, working on the level of the social imaginary, which is what we actually do with art. Yeah. So that's just a plateau year for not mix, mixing up all these notions um, and integrating everything into the art. Question? Hi. Um, I thought it was a really fascinating talk. Um, one of the examples that came to my mind when you were talking, which you didn't mention, but maybe would be interesting to follow on from what you just said, is Gustav Metzger's Art Strike. And I wondered whether you could maybe say something about that in terms of how you've thought about this, this very interesting kind of systematic way you've approached these different withdrawals. And I guess Gustav Metzger's Art Strike being an example of using a kind of political mechanism, the strike, the withdrawing of labor, um, which is not permanent, it's necessarily not permanent, but yeah, I wondered if you could say something about that. I must say I researched Metzger a long time ago and, and, and found he was not really a relevant example for this, so I, I can't answer in, in detail, but it's interesting to talk about the strike. Because the strike indeed aims for something. The strike has a clear purpose. So with regard to inactivity, it is whether an ostentatious inactivity yeah, or minimum a communicative inactivity. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, Lee Lozano has called this piece the general strike piece. Uh, that's actually the, the newspaper, that's the publication I've written that resumes all this research. And uh, I brought them, so you can have them. Um, but strictly speaking, it, it is not a strike. It is not even a general strike, what she's doing in the end. Yeah? It's true for the moment where she says, I'm not going out anymore. Yeah? I'm not going to openings. I call you, come talk to me, because what I want is another form of social interaction that really has a personal level, that has depth, that can develop you know, without an end, etc. Um, and there are a lot of strikes yeah? in New York, for example, Art Writers Coalition, but also an artist like Henry, Flim Henry Flint, who was said to be an art dropout, which is not true at all. He was an artist who had no success, 
and st stopped practicing, but what he was doing at the time was protesting against museum, protesting against curators, art market. Yeah. Um, this is activity, this is action. Yeah. It just plays on a different level. Okay, he's not painting, but so what? Yeah. He's playing his role, if that's an answer. And I think Gustav Metzger, he was a very serious and very radical person, and he knew how to deal with that very well. But um, from my understanding, he didn't want to leave the art world to, to go someplace else where he can be more efficient with, what he, with his criticism, especially on fascism. Yeah, no, I guess as I understood it, it's not something I know a huge amount about. The strike was very deliberately to kind of bring down all of the kind of institutions of art, the market, the galleries, the museums. So the strike would have this effect of within three years, everything would be, would collapse. And then there was a way to then begin again, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, one last question. I think we'll have to take a break after that. Uh, hello. Um, uh, first question. Um, uh, one very famous ex-artist is uh, Adolf Hitler. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, he would be a progressive dropout in your conversation? <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> um, well, he was a successless artist, right? To start with. Was yeah, he an actor in the art Was he failed or was he progressive dropout? I never thought about this, but it's a good point, because um, even though it's a really weird example, um, but it's <laughs> maybe one of those cases where you see that someone has a, an, an, an aesthetic understanding of things developed out of an artistic practice, and then clearly knows how to deal with that symbolic dimension on the, on the field of politics, propaganda, city planning, uh, mise-en-scene, etc. So you could say that this is some sort of Gesamtkunstwerk, yeah? um, which there's probably kilometers of literature that had been written on this, but I never got in touch with it. Uh, can I ask another question? Um, uh, uh, I feel your reference is the art world, and your reference is um, the institutional definition of art. You t seem to take that as a given. When you talk about art, you talk about an institutional definition of art. That's a decision I've a taken for, for this historiographic and theoretic work, yes. Yes, and then you kind of, I feel you, you, you find a weak point. The dropout is a weak point, mm -hmm. but the consequence of what you're speaking is is like a broadening of of you are really killing art in a way you're killing the institutional definition because you focus on the dropout and then you have to raise your head and look around well indeed, that's what I feel mm, you are saying i mean in in it is true that <clears throat> You can, you can say that, especially someone like Charlotte Posenenska, but it's true for Lozano also, even though she doesn't have a progressive direction in it. It's maybe the most radical form of institutional critique that you can possibly imagine. Because it's a, a, a critique or resistance against the institution of art as a whole. You know, it's not addressing specific institutions like the museum, the market, etc. No, art as a whole. Yeah, um, and this indeed is uh, like the the worst case scenario. Yeah, for for the institutional notion uh, of art, it, it it really brings the whole thing to to a border where it's really difficult to to grasp. So I think this is this is something really fascinating, and this is a, a, a zone that opens up and a problem that opens up only through the dropout artists. Yeah. If, if that's an answer. 
And if, I mean, if, if it's not that I'm trying to destroy uh, this, but these guys bring you there, and I think it helps understanding a lot about uh, our limits yeah, within this institutional art world. And actually also see how rigid it is, which it is. Okay, I see that there's one, I will allow one last question and then uh, we have to take a break to, to move forward in the program. I, I think uh, the thought of the artist dropout can be very daunting, especially to us emerging artists who are always questioning uh, the value of our work. I think most of the time, most people haven't don't see any value in what they create, or so. So, like the artist dropout is kind of like a, a very. Uh, it's kind of facing your dark self, because uh, nobody wants to drop out in anything, you know. Because uh, to quit represents kind of like the ultimate sin, because already. Uh, you always try to overcome mediocrity, and then, and you and you're always accepting failure because it's part of progress. And then, and then to quit is like uh, the ultimate disaster. You know? Yeah. Um, so I feel. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of speaking to other emerging uh, persons like me who uh, that. So I think the question is not whether we can. Uh, it, it's. The question is not whether you're a quitter or not. I think the question um, is what, how, how much faith do I have, not just in myself, but in, in actually in, in my voice? Mm -hmm. Because I think that is the ultimate cause. It's like, what, what is, you know, because art is just a framework for me to be able to engage with the world and to yep. translate and to reflect and to process and to recreate and to et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So uh, um, me, for example, I, 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 as much as I'm very inspired by, you know, the, the high art genius, as you spoke about, you know, but I think the real genius for me as a black person comes from the ghetto superstars who, mm -hmm. who, who I mean, when you're black, you can't quit. <laughs> you know, the, the nigger cannot quit. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, already the society doesn't believe in you and there are no doors. And so you, so you have to break walls. You have to, you have to create paths. You have to build doors. You have to dissolve all kinds of racial constructs and whatever perceptions that the, the world has. So I'm speaking to the emerging artists. I'm saying, you know, the value is in the cause, you know, that I think that's where the strength is. So... I mean, uh, you touch on, on I, something... So I can't quit. Um, <laughs> well, you touch on something, just a, a, a quick answer to this. Um, when, when I speak with art students on, on this topic, we often have the same discussion, that this is opening up um, a different vision for them often, because often they have the feeling it's whether achieving or failing. Which is absolutely stupid, because there's zillions of paths that you can possibly go, and an art school is just one of those places where you train yourself in many different things, and there's many different ways you can go. Yeah? And it's not about being an artist and not being an artist, it's about developing your voice yeah, and finding the best spaces of resonance for that voice. And places of art are one option for this, but not for everybody it's the best option. And if you get that clear, the world becomes much wider and there's much less pressure in fulfilling that role, actually. Yeah. And, and many, many, many young artists don't want to fulfill that role also. Yeah. But where do they go then, even in, in with, with the self-image? So, there's a lot to, to work on in the future, I think. Thank you very much.